very happy to be here this morning and very happy that uh, those of you who are not typically early risers on Saturday found the way to uh, trek up to Teachers College for what I know is going to be a really interesting session with uh, Dr. Satcher. David Satcher was very instrumental to the work that Mindy Fullylove and I have been doing over the course of the last 25 years in HIV AIDS and I know that uh, now that he is more or less removed from some of the complications of being in government, uh, much of what he has to say will reflect both, not just on what it was like to be Surgeon General, what it was like to be the head of the CDC, but what it's like as well to be in an academic medical center that is still engaged with issues related to health disparities. Sort of sobering to reflect on the fact that I started working in HIV AIDS in 1986. Show of hands, how many of you were alive in 1986? Okay, that's pretty good. And you were doing research in 1986? That, that, yeah. Mindy Fullylove and I were both at the University of California. I was at Berkeley, she was at the University of, San, the University of California, San Francisco. She was a community psychiatrist working in the Tenderloin, and I was operating a math science program on the UC Berkeley campus. It was one of those uh, interesting quirks of fate that in that year, University of California, San Francisco decided to go after funding to establish an AIDS research center that would very closely examine the progression of the epidemic in 1986 in the city of San Francisco. Now many of you are aware of the fact, if you've been studying the evolution of HIV, that California remains one of the epicenters for the epidemic of HIV in gay white men. And not surprisingly, the work that investigators at UCSF were trying to get funded focused largely on the Castro district, that uh, mecca, if you will, for gay men of that era, because rates of infection in that particular community were sky high, in excess of 30%. The problem that many people in the San Francisco Bay Area worried about as this center was being put together was that the focus seemed to be entirely on just one community and on one set of issues, namely the relationship between gay lifestyles and risk for exposure to HIV. A group of community activists went to UCSF and said the following, HIV is more and more an epidemic of people of color as well. Your failure to include any researchers who are interested in understanding how AIDS is affecting minority communities really means that you're only doing part of your job. If you are unable to include a group of minority researchers in your perspectives for putting together what would eventually become the Center for AIDS Prevention Studies, we worry that you're going to miss some important elements of what's driving this epidemic. To make a long story short, and by the way, this is a tale that's actually repeated in a book that Jacob Levinson wrote a couple of years ago called AIDS in the Black Community, where you can sort of see, at least from a journalist's perspective, what it was like to be engaged in that kind of ideological struggle at that particular point in the epidemic. But what I want to do is simply flash forward to the fact that when the decision was finally made that there would be a group of minority investigators looking at HIV, it is perhaps a function of the fact that Mindy and I were not traditional public health researchers that we started questioning some of the major assumptions that were driving the way HIV research was being conducted and the way a lot of HIV prevention efforts were being funded. We were concerned about the fact, for example, that in reporting statistics describing the epidemic in looking at surveillance data, one of the things that was always prominently displayed were the growing differences between blacks, whites, and Hispanics with respect to the burden that each of their communities were bearing with respect to the epidemic. By looking at HIV as a function of race ethnicity, which increasingly has dominated the way we've talked about this epidemic, part of what happens is that we began to, as a nation, get the sense that your race was somehow a unique independent risk factor describing the likelihood that you'd be exposed to HIV and would ultimately become affected. It's an interesting notion because it uh, 
for more than a number of important reasons, seemed to center our focus of the epidemic on the victims themselves, on the folk who were being most caught up. And it suggested that if we were to understand HIV, we'd have to understand two factors. The nature of the individuals who were engaged in risk behavior and the nature of their exposures. Well, the problem with this view is that if you think about it carefully, if race is in fact, and here I'm speaking to your sense of science, an independent risk factor describing what's going on with the epidemic, then black people, no matter where they were, would face the same risks of being infected. In other words, whether you lived in San Antonio, Texas, or in Mont Haven, here in the Bronx, the likelihood that you'd be infected would be the same. The odds, were you to calculate them, would be pretty much exactly the same. But that's not what we were beginning to see, even as early as 1986. It became real clear that there was a geography to the epidemic, and that geography was something that people weren't paying attention to. Here's a way of describing it, I think, in terms that are relatively easy to see. A black man in Topeka, Kansas, in 2013, has less a likelihood of being exposed to HIV than a white man here in New York City. If race is indeed an independent risk factor for risk and exposure, then that kind of difference shouldn't exist. Someone in Topeka should look exactly like someone in Harlem, but that is not what the data show. Increasingly, we were trying to demonstrate to folk at the CDC and uh, others in the public health service that if you simply looked at the geography of HIV, you'd have to deal with the puzzling fact that New York City, which has only a fraction of a percent of the U.S. population, has since 1981 borne at least 15 to 17 percent of the burden of this epidemic. Meaning that if you look at it very carefully, within a two-hour drive of this campus right now, you're going to see roughly 25 percent of all the cases of AIDS that have ever been reported to the Centers for Disease Control. This suggests that what we're looking at is an epidemic that has a geography and an ecology. So understanding what that has been about has certainly been at the center of what Mindy Fully Love has been studying for the last 20 years. What is it about communities? What is it specifically about poor communities of color that makes them so likely to be in the crosshairs of this particular virus? What's going on? It's at that point that uh, we did something that I think is really quite unusual. We started to look for answers to this present dilemma by examining the past. And that's something that uh, in the 21st century is increasingly being overlooked. We are so engaged in understanding the present. We are so involved in trying to deal with the reality that is presented to us by the internet, by our cell phones, and by all that's going on around us that we've sort of forgotten that where we are right now represents the end stage of some historical processes that probably need to be examined if we're to really understand what's going on. This is another way of saying that uh, our fascination, our obsession with the present, really obscured some of the major changes that occurred in the United States over the course of the last 50 or 60 years that really laid the groundwork for the creation of the HIV AIDS epidemic that we have today and really explains why minority communities, but most especially the black community, bear such a heavy burden with respect to understanding what's really going on. Now, this is easy for me to say. Uh, I'm increasingly aware of the fact that when I give up whatever wisdom I may have acquired in the course of my academic training, that I'm reflecting on the fact that I've been around for a long time. I was born in 1944, which means that I just finished celebrating my 69th birthday. And yeah, don't I look good for somebody that old? Yeah. I tell myself I should never do that, but this is a naked appeal for applause. It's true. People are so happy to see an old guy who can still stand up and do it that, you know, it's just like automatic that your hands go to clapping. Why is uh, reflecting on my age so critical? Because I'm someone who lived through urban renewal. What has urban renewal got to do with HIV AIDS? The answer is everything. And let's understand why it has everything to do with our understanding of this epidemic. I knew a black community in the New York metropolitan area that was intact, that was family-oriented. If you look at the statistics 
gathered by the census in 1950, one of the things you'll discover about Harlem is that it was a community where 85% of the adults were married. That is to say that most of the children who were raised in that era were folk who had a two-parent household. Let's flash forward a bit to the time that Mindy and I have spent at Columbia. In 1990, after the publication of that rather shocking piece in the New England Journal of Medicine, Excess Mortality in Harlem, do you remember that piece? This is the one that said that black men in Harlem, based on 1980 data, had a lower likelihood of living to the age of 50 than men in Bangladesh, where the life expectancy of men in that community was estimated to be around 49, when it's almost 70 for the rest of the United States. Well, one of the things that the CDC did was say, okay, that's great as a way of understanding surveillance statistics, but what happens if you actually interview the population and ask them about a variety of things related to their health risks? So we engaged in a study, the Harlem Household Study, that took us almost five years to complete, which was a random stratified sample of 1,000 households in Harlem. This is important because those of you who know something about sampling know that this is a way of getting really accurate estimates about what's going on in that community. Well, one of the things that we discovered in contrast to the 1950 census was that only 16% of the adults that we interviewed were married. If you add to that number the folk who were living without benefit of clergy, you know, folk who were just living together but aren't married, the number only went to 21%. But 58% of our respondents said that they had kids. What happened between 1950 and 1990 when we started that survey to explain this sudden drastic change in the nature of the community? Well, let me answer the conundrum that I've just tried to pose by asking you a question. What would happen to any community in any urban area anywhere in the world if Overnight, you suddenly took one half of all the men out of the community and removed them from understanding and being a part of community life. What happened to Harlem between 1950 and 1991 is what has basically happened in almost all urban areas in the United States with a significant population of black men. The war on drugs, number one, and mass incarceration, number two. Think about it. In 1970, there were 200,000 men doing time in state and federal prisons. 1970 is the time when Richard Nixon declared a war on drugs, saying that drugs were public enemy number one. And with the establishment in 1972 of the Drug Enforcement Agency, we took an issue, drug use, abuse, and substance abuse dependence, which is a set of phenomena that we can deal with particularly if we think about the ways in which drug treatment works. We could have taken this medical crisis, this public health tragedy, and we could have treated the problems in the community that were so much a part of wide-scale abuse of and addiction to drugs. We couldn't have cured it. Let's be clear, drug addiction is a... Uh, series of phenomena that really result in our being able not so much to get people forever off drugs, but we know how to stabilize people who are living with this problem. We know how to make them part of their families and their communities. And although they may be subject to relapse from time to time, folk who have successfully completed drug treatment typically are able to, leave, to live excuse me, more or less normal lives. That is not what we did. The war on drugs was basically an effort to say that this represents criminal behavior. So what we did instead was take something that we might have been able to successfully treat and convert it into an issue that was basically going to be managed by the police and by the courts. So what did that do? Well, many of you can remember what the 1970s were like when, especially in New York City, you were starting to see a really drastic train change with respect to the presence of drugs, heroin, and to some small extent cocaine, just present everywhere. This family-oriented community was now a place where you used to see, for those of you who read, for example, Man, Child, in the Promised Land, young men nodding out on the corner, groups of folk who were unemployed sort of gathering around waiting every afternoon for the dope man to arrive. 
the, the, the family-oriented community that I knew in the 1950s in Harlem had more or less changed dramatically. And the fact that the folk on the street became the subject of all kinds of sweeps conducted by the cops meant that you were going to see a sudden drastic change in the relationship that men had to their families and to the communities. Why did this occur? Because they were gone. 200,000 men doing time in state and federal facilities in the year 1972 Fast forward to 2010, that number has grown to 2.3 million. If you add to that number the 5.7 million folk who are on parole, on probation, and who are under the supervision of the courts, you suddenly have a phenomenon that is difficult to describe. The United States has 5% of the world's population, but incarcerates 25% of all the prisoners in the world currently doing time in an institution of incarceration. 5% of the population, 25% of the world's prisoners here in the United States. And who are those prisoners? Well, they look like the men from Harlem. In 2009, 41% of all the inmates doing time in state or federal prisons in the United States were African American. Add to that another 18%, and all of a sudden, two-thirds of our incarcerated population represents men of color. It's not just that they're men of color. They are men of color who, in an educational institution like this, are of particular interest to us because these are the folk who did not finish high school, are functionally illiterate, and are unable to participate in the post-industrial world that we have been so madly creating over the course of the last 25 years. What that means in places like Harlem or Mount Haven is that on any given day of the year, Somewhere between 30 to 40 percent of all the young men between the ages of 16 and 19 are gone. They're doing time upstate. What does that do to a community, once again, to have such a significant portion of the men in the neighborhood suddenly disappear? They're, they're no longer there. And how did that happen? Well, those of you who lived through the crack cocaine era recall what it was like when all of a sudden you had this hugely addictive substance that was basically being dealt by children. We live in a capitalist society, so drug dealers are probably as canny, as intelligent as any other capitalist. And they understood that if they were going to engage in an illegal activity that was going to be heavily surveyed by the cops, the one thing they could not afford to do was to have the people on the street who were dealing the drugs gone. If your, sales folk, if your sales force excuse me, is locked up, how are you going to maintain your profit edge? How are you going to maintain your profit margin? Well, the answer was, if you're going to have folk in the process of passing out drugs, why not make them 16 or younger? Why not assure that if they are arrested, which was almost inevitable, that their status as juveniles would mean that they'd be returned to the streets within 24 to 48 hours? It meant that you had a constant sales force present in the neighborhood. You had a constant way of making sure that the poison that they were dealing was always present. And you had a way of making sure that what was once a family-oriented community was now going to change drastically. I want to be clear that part of what accounts for this sudden influx of drugs is not the pathological behavior of the folk who were in the community who were caught up in the mix. What I'm trying to suggest when I talk about Mindy Fully Love's work in urban renewal was one of the biggest changes that occurred to black communities nationwide was the 1949 Housing Act passed after World War II that was designed to modernize American cities, designed to make our urban areas productive centers of commerce. In 1949, when the Congress and city fathers in places like Newark, New Jersey, my hometown, were looking out over their terrain, the first thing that struck them was the degree to which the Great Migration at the beginning of the 20th century had brought all these African Americans from the South into the inner city, where they settled in places where the housing was inadequate, often of second and third class quality. But because of its poor quality, it meant that they could afford to live there. They established communities. That description of Harlem in the 1950s as a family-oriented community was a description of a place where people were uniformly and routinely poor, but they were proud of where they lived and they maintained those communities. 
despite the fact that the housing stock was really lousy, they were able to create businesses, they were able to create neighborhoods, they were able to create not just neighborhoods, but neighborhoods where children were able to flourish. Everybody knew everybody else. It wasn't just a collection of people of the same color, these were folk who were truly neighbors, which meant that they exchanged an enormous amount of social capital. This is a place where those of you who grew up in that era can recall as one where uh, everybody on the block knew you. All the adults knew your name. All the adults not only knew your name, they knew the name of your parents as well. If you did something stupid, it was real clear that someone on the block had the right to sanction you. Some of us, and you're, there are folk nodding their heads because they remember this. Yeah, you're walking home and all of a sudden, Sister Mary, who's a good friend of your mom, comes out and says, boy, I saw what you did. Bah, 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 bah. Thank you. Yeah, that really happened, you know. And then when you got home, boy, I heard what you did. Bah, 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 bah. That's what happens when communities are stable. That's what happens when community functioning really basically depends not just on how well families are integrated one with another, but on how well groups of families are connected to each other. We call this having weak ties. Where, okay, you're not of my blood. You're not really a member of my family, but we're all in this together. And what happens to your kids is going to influence what happens to my kids. And the raising of children is a collective activity. Isn't that what we expect of really well-functioning communities? That they are cohesive? That they display what we call collective efficacy? And where that efficacy is never more eloquently demonstrated than in our capacity to raise children to live as adults, as contributing members of the community. Well, as soon as you start to do what happened with the Housing Act of 1949, which was to declare neighborhoods like the Central Ward of Newark, blighted, declare that the land actually belongs to the city using the right of eminent domain, and where the decision to make a brand new city means bulldozing neighborhoods like this out of existence, two things happen. You not only destroy the nature of community life by removing homes and people who are in those homes from existence, you set the folk who are now homeless into motion. And in too many cities, what this represented was a movement from poor and frequently racially integrated neighborhoods into housing projects financed by local and federal government funding that were enormously segregated. Public housing in the United States becomes a place where almost 90% of the residents who are African Americans are going to be living with other poor African Americans. And all those carefully constructed over generations, community ties that make it possible for neighbors to cohere with each other, they're suddenly removed. Nobody knows anybody. You're now moving into a place where you don't know your neighbors. Those of you who live in New York, I know, probably enjoy that unique New York phenomenon of being proud of the fact that you don't know your neighbors. You don't speak to each other. You might nod. But that's pretty much it. The, the whole notion that you would knock on the neighbor next door, say, hey, my name is so-and-so, come in and, you know, have a party. Folks in New York don't do that. Folks in most urban areas don't do that. And I want to suggest that the beginning of this radical individualization of urban population really begins with urban renewal and the ways in which it transformed the communities that were once stable places for raising kids. So what happens when all of a sudden the neighborliness that describes community life is no longer there. Well, amongst other things, it becomes possible for folks to deal drugs in the street. There isn't anybody watching the neighborhood. There isn't anybody watching the corners. There isn't anybody watching the middle of the block. Sure, you can recruit kids to engage in stuff like this because other than their families, who's watching them? Who's taking care of them? The quality of their schools is going rapidly into the toilet. So the whole notion that, number one, you have an urban area that is increasingly de-industrialized. There are no unskilled jobs out in the community anymore. There are no longer places where someone with less than a high school education is going to be employed. Add to that all of a sudden the creation of an underground economy that says if you want to make money, deal drugs. 
and then create a community setting where kids can, be gone, can become the major mules, the major soldiers who carry the sale of drugs into the street, and all of a sudden you're going to create exactly the kind of environment, precisely the kind of ecology that's going to make it possible for the cops and the courts to say, okay, since you can't handle your problems, we will. And this, thus begins the cycle of mass incarceration, leading to those scary statistics that I just described. So what has this got to do with HIV AIDS? Everything, right? In 1970, we started locking up precisely those individuals who were most likely to have been exposed to the virus. <clears throat> Recall that <clears throat> Excuse me, 1981 might be the year when we acknowledge the existence and the presence of HIV in our midst. But what we are acknowledging was data that we gathered from looking at a group of men who presented to medical authorities at the end stage of HIV disease. If HIV is a virus that is latent in the body for 10 to 12 to maybe even 15 years, the 15 years prior to our viewing gay men with Kaposi sarcoma and pneumocystis pneumonia are precisely the years when the epidemic was taking seed everywhere, but especially in minority communities, and especially in the person of individuals who were sharing needles as an efficient way of getting high and spending what money they had on the product that was keeping them alert, awake, and alive. We locked up the group that was in greatest risk for HIV disease. And I'm one of those who believes that in that period between 72 and 81, you had a great deal of HIV transmission in the prisons. Who amongst, amongst us isn't aware of the fact that prisons are places where people have sex? Now, if you're a member of a State Department of Corrections, maybe it's not a good idea for you to acknowledge that. Because if you knew that there was sex going on in prison, and if you knew that that sex was unprotected, and you knew it was sex that might include someone whose involvement with drugs had infected them with HIV, then you would be morally obligated to provide condoms, aware of the fact that that's the most efficient way of presenting, preventing excuse me, the transmission of this virus. But that's not what happened. And my belief is that what we see in data that suggests that maybe 40% of all inmates in the United States are sexually active at some point in time in their incarceration, either through consensual sex or through rape. I really do believe that that coupled with the drug use, which is also present in prisons, created an absolute fascinating opportunity for this virus to be transmitted from one person to another. And then in the course of the return of so many of these incarcerated persons into the community, you create this interesting machine that circulates HIV between the prisons and the community and then back again. Back again? How does that happen? Well, look at the recidivists. Look at the numbers that describe recidivism in prisons in the United States. 70%, according to the Bureau of Justice Statistics, of the men who are incarcerated and released into the community will go back within three years lacking education, lacking employment opportunities, the likelihood that they'll re-engage in the life that exposed them to the police in the first place is pretty high. So we're not surprised that many of them go back. And lately it becomes apparent that it's not just that men go back because they commit new crimes. Men go back because they violate the conditions of their parole. There are some estimates that say that somewhere between 40 and 50% of all the folk who are currently doing time in prison are there not because they have committed new crimes. They're there because, for whatever reason, their parole has been revoked and they're back where they started. Well, I'm, if I'm correct that that cycling back and forth between the prison and the communities meant that you kept the virus in motion, then what better explanation could we have for explaining why 50% of all the new cases of HIV in the United States are typically found in the African American community. Why should we be surprised where statistics indicate that rates of HIV infection in prisons are two to three times what they are in the general population? 
And why should we, we be surprised that New York City has become an epicenter for the HIV epidemic when somewhere between 65 and 75 percent of all the men doing time in the 66 state prisons in the state of New York are from seven neighborhoods in New York City. Our upstate prison population is largely composed of folk who live right here in our midst. And if you look at those seven neighborhoods, one of the features that will strike you most prominently is that these tend to be the neighborhoods with the highest HIV background serial prevalence rates, not just in New York City, but in the United States. Some of you who've seen uh, those reports coming out of the Black AIDS Institute that suggest that if you look at urban areas where HIV is present in the African American community, if you look at African Americana as if it were a nation, it would be 13th in the world with respect to the size of its HIV epidemic. This is a way of sort of describing how these phenomena of constant motion, community destruction, community relocation, and mass incarceration have produced the epidemic that we're dealing with today. And understand that it's not just that you had large numbers of men locked up in places where they had a rather incredible opportunity to share the virus with each other. We're also talking about what happens to formerly incarcerated persons when they're back in the community, a phenomenon that has been eloquently described by Michelle Alexander in the book The New Jim Crow, which I strongly urge all of you to read. The New Jim Crow. I'm somebody who was raised in New Orleans, my family is from Mississippi. Being born in 1944 means that I really understood what it was like to live in a world that was very neatly structured socially by white-only, colored-only signs where segregation was a way of life. One has the sense that post the Civil Rights Movement, we have now, with the election of Barack Obama, entered a new post-racial era where race no longer matters, where Jim Crow, for all intents and purposes, is dead. Michelle Alexander argues, wrong doesn't work like that. We no longer have seg segregation as a de jure feature of many communities. What we have instead is something that's much more personal. It's best understood by examining the characteristics of individuals who have a felony conviction and who are now walking about. They're not citizens anymore. In all but a few states in the United States, if you are convicted of a felony, you've permanently lost your right to vote. In some states, after you have completed your parole, you can get that back. But for the most part, even re-establishing your rights to vote really represents a process that is long, arduous, and in many instances, highly stigmatizing. So, okay, you have a bunch of folk who are no longer citizens. What could be so bad about that? Well, it's not just that. Understand that in many cities, like New York City, if you've been convicted of a felony, and it was at all related to drugs, you permanently lost your right to qualify for access to public housing. This means that not only can you get into the housing that's subsidized by welfare or by the housing authority, if your family takes you back into your house, they could be expelled as well. So a lot of families suddenly face the decision with someone who is returning from a bid of state of risking being homeless by letting the returning inmate back into the house or saying, baby, sorry, I can't help you, but uh, in order to keep a roof over our heads, you've got to be elsewhere. This is a factor that contributes hugely to a homeless population here in New York City where one of the most important risk factors for being a male who is homeless is being someone who has a history of a felony. It goes beyond that. I described inmates as being folk who have uh, very low levels of education. In many states, you don't qualify for educational loans if you have a felony conviction on your record, which means that one of the most important ways we could rehabilitate this population, namely giving them an education and providing them with the means to become gainfully employed, even in this economy, is now removed. It's a way of sort of describing a sort of a permanent disability that now afflicts the community. 
and that probably has as its most deleterious effect the impact that it has on kids. Kids from families where both members, or even one member of the family, has been incarcerated themselves run a huge risk for having this happen. And those of you who teach in New York City schools, especially those in the inner city, are probably increasingly aware of the fact that so many young men enter high school with the notion that they have no future out there, that whatever future they have is probably bound up in being part of this population of incarcerated men. So they act like, they act like folk who are basically biding their time before it's their turn to go into the joint. I want to suggest that what this creates is a community that has a sense of itself that lacks a vision of the future. I want to suggest that HIV is just one of the inflictions that has dominated community life as a result of the destruction of what was once a series of communities, a series of neighborhoods that were dominated by life in a family. That with the loss of the social control that makes it possible for us to assure that young people have a place in our educational system and later on in the community, by making the prison the ever-present reality for so many of these young folk, HIV is just one of the problems created by this decline in community life. The notion that one out of every three black men in the United States will do time in a state or federal prison in his life is a way of describing the shocking differences that have occurred in community life between 1950 and the present. One out of every three. Those of you who have a criminal justice background probably are aware of the fact that uh, Commissioner Kelly has often said, I don't do racial profiling. My cops are not really about that. And part of what he is saying is that if you look at the statistics on incarceration, isn't it reasonable to suppose that any black man walking the street is possibly a potential criminal, and therefore you have uh, every right to stop him and frisk him to see whether or not he's carrying drugs or guns or both. There's probable cause. Look at the numbers. What I'm describing is not just the ecology of HIV. I'm describing something that is slowly but surely destruct, destroying the fabric of American life. If we are a place that solves its problems, and social dilemmas by resorting to the police and the courts. What's left of our democracy? All right, you can't give a talk like this. Did I scare you all enough? I, I got more. You know, I can go on like this for days without, without talking about something that looks like solutions. And I'm about to run out of time, huh? Uh, I, didn't I know. Okay, I'm just checking. Um, eight, Good. Eight or nine minutes. Exactly what I need. Every Monday for the last three semesters. I've gotten up at... Yeah, good, because I'm getting dry. I've got the cold that I think is going around that many of you are probably dealing with. Thank you for coughing. I, mean, I, I like punctuation for the things that I say. I got eight minutes, I can last, thank you. Sorry to say that every, uh, every Monday morning I get up at 5.30 and I drive two hours to Woodbourne State Correctional Facility. I teach a class as part of the Bard College Prison Initiative. I have 19 inmates. They're college students, meaning that they're not simply folk who are bored to death with what's going on on the inside and are taking a class just to relieve the boredom. No, these are folk who've passed an interest test, who've been interviewed, who are honest to God college students. I'm teaching them public health. I'm trying to create a public health program with the notion that because Woodbourne is a medium security facility, a lot of these folks are going to get out, and with public health training, they could be part of the workforce that will be created by the Affordable Care Act. Aren't we trying to get large numbers of folks in poor communities who are uninsured to trust the medical establishment, to pick up the insurance so that we go to a system that's less about illness management and more about prevention because everybody gets a yearly checkup, something that doesn't happen to 50 million Americans who are living without insurance? Yeah, these guys could really do that. They're smart enough, they're bright enough, and for all the teachers and professors in the audience, I cannot tell you what it's like to show up 9 o'clock in the morning and have a group of students who have all read the assignment. <laughs> Can I get an amen? Not only have they read the assignment, they're ready to fight with me about it. Doc, I don't know about this. I love this. 
Why is that important? We used to do this routinely as a nation. We used to be really clear that prisons were places where folk got rehabilitated. In 1970, with the war on drugs, we decided that we really didn't like criminals. And we decided that prisons were places where they had to be punished. And a lot of educational programs were taken out of just about every state facility that I know about, not just in New York, but nationwide. But the stats are really clear. Someone who's been educated in college has a vanishingly small chance of returning to prison as a recidivist. I mean, you want to know what you can do without spending billions of dollars, without getting grants and contracts that are enormous? Figure out how to create educational opportunities in settings like this, because the impact it will have on the lives of the prisons, prisoners is really enormous. So many states are running out of money and deciding that the first thing they have to do is close down their prisons. You, you see the size of the population reflected in the statistics I gave earlier. Well, remember that everybody who's locked up on the inside is costing you, the taxpayer, $30,000 a year to remain on the inside. $30,000 a year is, for many people, the cost of a college education. And if you're spending $30,000 to keep a man on a bunk walking around for years on end, what good has it done the individual or the society that put him there? I want to suggest that this notion that Bard College has developed, that this represents a group of men who have all kinds of capacities. My guys almost all come from New York City. Many of them have been there since their teenage years. They're in their 40s and they've never known anything in their adult life other than the inside of a prison. That they are so bright, that they are so gifted, frequently brings me almost to the point of tears when I leave because I wonder what community life had been back had they had the capacity to remain instead of being wasted in some place in the middle of Sullivan County, which is uh, basically no place. Now, the idea that those of us who are educators have a real role to play in maybe reversing the trends that I've just described, stopping that circulation from prison to the community and then back to the community again, that part of what that means is not only does this become an effective way of dealing with HIV, it also becomes an effective way of re-knitting community life that has been so totally fractured by so much movement in and out of neighborhoods, in and out of the warp and woof of the policies that have been created by our unique American vision of urbanism. Now, the notion that there is stuff to be done to rehabilitate a group of folk who, in many instances, are perfectly able to resume life in the community as contributing members of the community is an idea whose time has come. And I'm also trying to suggest that they become, in many instances, for those of us who are engaged in HIV prevention, one of the most effective prevention tools that we can put together. The AIDS Institute, State of New York, has started to do some very interesting training on HIV prevention behavior using inmates in all of these facilities. And these are folk who are really aware of the risks, aware of the benefits, and are fully able to come back to the community as allies in our efforts to contain not just this, but all the other ailments that we associate with health disparities. I want to suggest that although I've tried to paint a picture that is uniformly bleak, you cannot sit in a classroom like the one I have at Woodburn and not believe that maybe, just maybe, looking at the lives of men who have been so disadvantaged by a series of public policies that are truly unfortunate, that maybe, just maybe, rather than viewing them as part of the problem, they become part of the solution. Thank you. about HIV AIDS syndemics, often the factors that are associated with uh, HIV prevalence expand to include not only um, various types of individual behavior, sexual behavior, compulsive sexual behavior, substance abuse, 
So are you telling us that when we think about HIV AIDS endemics that we are required to fundamentally expand that to consider the various social determinants that include housing, that include uh, urbanization, displacement, and could you just comment on that? Yeah, I had said in the beginning of my comments that uh, David Satcher, I think, is a critical individual in thinking through the response to that question because he was the one who started to say, if you're going to really understand the nature of the public health challenges that exist in the United States, you have to look beyond a medical model that focuses exclusively on the patient and on patient risk behaviors. You have to look at the social context in which they live. On a number of occasions, Mindy Fullilove and I were invited to present in front of Satcher's uh, core of directors, where we sort of talked about the ideas that I've presented in part this morning, suggesting that if we're really going to be successful in thinking about how to have public health that works in the United States, one of the most important things we're going to have to do is look at community, context, and ways in which people in medicine and public health can work with folk in housing, folk in education, folk in criminal justice, folk in other words who are dealing with all the aspects of the social life of the community. What's critical is that this is now reflected very strongly in Healthy People 2020, the health goals that we set for the nation every 10 years. There are a number of elements of Healthy People 2020 that urge public health practitioners to make common cause with folk in other agencies, other bureaus, other offices, where elements of the social dynamic that drive so much in the way of health disparities can be fashioned into something that looks like a solution. So yes, uh, this is a way of saying that people in public health or in health education should in fact be getting out of their silos and thinking about ways in which they can reach across the aisle, so to speak, to deal with folk who are in other agencies, who have other pots of money, who have other resources that could be tapped to cr create a kind of a synthesis in which public health, medicine, and all of these other agencies work together to do what is necessary to confront problems like HIV or any of the other health disparities that have been the focus of much of what you've heard today and you, you heard yesterday in this conference. Well, it's award time. Uh. Okay, <laughs> let's stand over here. Oh, we can gotta, you're, we're going to take a nice photograph. So. Oh, getting rid of the water. <laughs> okay. Well, now you can see why we are giving this award to Professor Fully Love. As part of the celebration of the fifth annual Health Disparities Conference at Teachers College, Columbia University, and 10th anniversary celebration of the research group on disparities in health, and we just might mention that he's been the co-sponsor of most of the doctoral dissertations that have been produced, and since by June we will have had 82, that's a lot. <laughs> uh, Dr. Robert Fully Love is honored for service as an outstanding national leader and researcher advancing the science for health disparities and community research, and for exceptional dedication as a professor and mentor preparing new generations of professionals within the pipeline for careers in health disparities and community research. And we're so glad to hear that it includes those who are currently incarcerated. <laughs> 